Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second part of the Alberta Student Energy Conference webinar series. This series is running every month leading up to our conference date of February 18th and 19th during reading week and is meant to act as a teaser of conference events and topics. So first, a few housekeeping things. Um, we ask that you please change your Zoom name to your actual name and to please input any questions you may have during the webinar to the chat and they will be answered during the question period at the end. Um, we will also be having a cash prize raffle as well. Uh, you gain one ticket from attending this session and additional raffle tickets from asking questions um, and filling out the interactive survey at the end. The raffle winner will be decided in the coming days and the winner will be contacted through email. So yeah, we hope you enjoy this webinar with us and I'll be handing the reins over to Matt and Houston now for introductions. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is this is a really exciting opportunity, guys. I really appreciate um, being involved in this. I um, have a lot of uh, you know hope uh, when I see students uh, and and this community talk about it. And I've been involved with with this group since the beginning. Um, actually, the founders of the group originally um, graduated from Haskane with uh, with my my wife, who's also an instructor at the Haskane School of Business. So. I uh, really believe in, in, in this uh, approach of students taking ownership of their education. Um, and uh, I, so long story short, I'm not a, an academic by, by trade, I'm not a PhD. Uh, I come from, from industry. I, I was an entrepreneur. Um, all of my businesses were always focused on, on sustainability um, and, and had that kind of approach. Um, I've, I've worked in various industries and in consulting. Um, and then I've got, uh, after doing my executive MBA at Haskane, I, I got asked to teach a course in the space. And I, I taught it in a probably a very different approach than, than uh, students had had in the past. It was far more practical and about this idea that there's, there's a lot of problems that we need to solve um, and there's not one solution. Um, there's many solutions. And, and so, you know, I, I find that uh, I found my home now at, uh, in, in teaching. Um, I teach undergrads a required course on entrepreneurial thinking. Um, and then I also uh, teach MBAs and executive MBAs on strategies for sustainability. Um, and so, you know, I've, I found my home because I love teaching. I like uh, learning um, myself on how to teach better, but I also just love the energy I get from students, especially for student groups like this or Enactus or JDC West or other groups. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it short. Uh, um, I'm really looking forward to this. And, and my, my good friend and colleague Matt and I have been in this game for I don't even know how long we've been we've been working together, but uh, it, it's really nice to be actually um, working side by side with Matt. So, uh, Matt, do you want to do you want to do a, an intro? Sounds good. Thanks, Houston, and thanks again to the uh, ASEC group for inviting us in. I'm really looking forward to meeting you all, hearing some of your questions, sharing some of the work that I've been up to, uh, and responding to some of what of what Houston's going to share first. Uh, my name's Matt Mayer. I'm with a, a group called Arate Initiative. It's pronounced Arete, but it's spelled A-R-E-T-E. -E. The initiative is really to um, is to really bring forth the next wave of human and organizational potential. Uh, as Houston mentioned, we've been working together with you know, like minds, shared values, shared purpose, and intentions over the last ten years or so. Uh, my experience, I'll get into this a little bit more in, in my presentation, is that the best sustainability strategy, including understanding sustainability from a scientific perspective and practicing backcasting from a sustainable future always bumps up against the human and organizational barriers. Um, and so I've, I've been practicing sustainability strategy work for the last 10 years. And with our RTA initiative, we're, we're, we're coming at this from a slightly different angle where we're working with people, leadership and organizational systems, management systems, et cetera, to try to help those organizations do better work for society and the biosphere and future generations by virtue of being better humans, leading better, working better together, et cetera. So I'll share a little bit more about that. I also, one of our major projects is the Energy Futures Lab where we're connecting with, um, with the Natural Step Canada to do some work on that. And that's basically the, the gist of the presentation I'm gonna share today. Uh, I don't have a, a large experience in energy specifically, though I have been doing lots of work with the Energy Futures Lab for the last five years. And so I've, it's, been a, it's been a boot camp, uh, so to speak, with respect to understanding energy, what an energy future can and ought to be for an Albertan uh, and a global citizen. 
uh, and what that means for driving forth or accelerating a transition to a sustainable future. So I'm looking forward to sharing more with you. Again, thanks for the invitation. Houston's gonna kick us off. Uh, as Ru mentioned, please share your questions in the chat box because we look forward to responding to them and have a, having a discussion about them later on. Without further ado, I'll pass it back to Hugh, back to you, Houston, and uh, wishing you well. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, and I, I know that uh, this isn't a class by any means, but um, I love uh, seeing people's faces. So Gideon, thank you for having your camera on. Uh, that is awesome. It's nice to talk to a face rather than just a word. If you, you're not obligated to turn on your camera, but uh, um, you know that's something that I do miss a lot is uh, seeing people and, and uh, um, connecting with them. So uh, if, if you uh, have any questions as we go through, what we're going to do is actually um, save the questions to the end. Uh, Matt and I have designed our presentation to kind of flow one to the other. I'm going to speak for 15 minutes. Matt's going to speak for 15 minutes-ish. And then we're going to uh, transition to, to questions at the end. Um, so you're welcome to type in your question um, whenever it pops into your head. Uh, and then we will dialogue that or you can save it to the end. Um, and, you know, out, out of curiosity, uh, I just want to kind of pull the room is how many people are doing a business degree or in, in a business faculty, um, you know, whether it's in the chat or um, a thumbs up if you're in, in business. I just want to kind of uh, survey the group to see um, who's in business uh, and who, who uh, if, is there anybody doing a business degree. Nobody. <laughs> okay. I saw one. Uh, Houston. Awesome. Santiago has got you a saw one. Up. Awesome. Okay. All right. Oh yeah. One thumbs up. Yeah. Santiago. Fantastic. Good job, Santiago. All right. So then that allows me to understand uh, kind of what the, the room is like, uh, because if everybody was in the business, then, um, you know, I, I could make some assumptions in my presentation. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen now and start the, start the presentation. Um, and then, uh, again, if, if you have any questions, uh, just, just, uh, type them into, uh, the chat um, and uh, we'll get going. I'm going to set my timer so that I do not run into Matt's time because that's always rude. Um, and so, you know, I, I love this image of the chameleon um, and I, I talk about a lot. I teach a lot on adaptability and uncertainty. Um, and I find energy transition to be one of those areas where we sometimes in the media, we are really polarized. Um, we, there, there seems to be no middle ground. And I think that's what we need to move towards is, is talking more um, and, and stop relying on just sound bites. And so, um, you know, this idea of adaptability and uncertainty and resiliency, we hear it so much because of, of COVID. Um, and that's great that it's brought it to the forefront. But I also feel that uh, this is something that um, as a society, we need to become uh, more comfortable with. Uh, and I know my generation, you know, go to engineering school, become an engineer, you were going to go work at the pipe, you know, in, in pipelines in Calgary, for example, um, have a successful career, maybe be at one a company for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but as you saw about the recent announcement on Monday with you know, Husky being acquired by Sanofis and potentially being 2,000 jobs laid off. The uncertainty of the future in the energy sector in Alberta, um, th there's a lot of concern and questions around that. Um, and so, you know, this, this idea of problem solving is something that I always come back to. Um, because when we look at problems, they're, they're everywhere. We, we have, we have uh, challenges like uh, California had massive forest fires last year, uh, massive forest fires in BC and in Alberta, probably previously in Fort Mac, you know, uh, in other parts of, of the country, we've seen it. Um, we, have, we have struggles around food security and, and deforestation and, and uh, greenhouse gases from, you know, factory farming and, and some of the challenges around our food system. Um, we also have a lot of social challenges of, of poverty and, and, you know, uncertainty of people being able to afford uh, a, a minimum wage or live on a minimum wage. Um, we also have, um, you know, uh, big challenges to diversity, which is fantastic, whether it's the Me Too movement or the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we're starting to see shifts uh, in, in uh, what the boardroom looks like. And to me, this is something that I think is, is really important to be able to transition and have different conversations, is to start to have different ideas about and bring to different thoughts and, and opinions and viewpoints to the table and be able to listen to 
to them and not just make your decision and stick with them. Um, but the conversation today is about this transition. And I found this photo and I thought it was, you know, kind of relevant. It's obviously been, been photoshopped, I think, but it's this idea that in the, in the foreground, there's, there's an old school, you know, well, um, and then in the background, there's some, some, some wind uh, uh, power. And so, you know, there, there is some sort of transition taking place here. Um, and I think that you guys are going to be, you know, in hindsight, you guys are going to be living through this in the next decade. Um, and when you look at the global risks that you guys, and I pull this report from uh, the World Economic Forum every year, this was actually 2018, uh, but every year over the last seven years that I've been teaching, it shifted. Seven years ago, it was traditional things like access to capital and you know very traditional business model type things. Um, but now you're seeing you know, very, very different things popping up uh, for what are risks. Um, you know, and I think that energy, you know, has a lot to do with this, whether it's from weapons all the way down through water crisis, it's like the energy kind of flows through all of these. Um, and with the, 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 uh, the coming up election in the US, we're going to see even more turbulent times, no matter which way it goes. Um, and so I think that businesses, individuals, and your generation going into the workforce really needs to understand that this instability, this globalization, and, and this quote from, from Reeves is this idea of, you know, we need to have greater transparency. We need to have greater conversations, and we need to be able to um, kind of upend the business environment. We need to, I don't know, revolution is too hard of a, a word, but we, we need to start to approach things differently. And I see so many amazing examples of that locally, um, nationally, and globally. Um, so there's, it's not for a shortage of successful business models, but sometimes it's a will of, of you know, big organizations to, to step out of their, their traditional uh, uh, business model and maybe pivot or try something new or have a different conversation. Uh, but there is a lot of unease and, and I can feel it in my room. I asked my executive MBAs on the weekend, um, and these are, you know, 40, 50 year old people coming back to do a degree, 15 years of work experience. They're very concerned about the future. They're very concerned about, you know, their job security and, and that. And, and that's very unlikely, not since about 81, 82, uh, would you hear that type of conversation in Calgary um, and in Alberta. And, and it's around that energy transition, what's happening. Um, and, and this idea that people as well as businesses need to be more adaptable is something that I'm, I'm just going to kind of um, really lead with in this, in this presentation. Um, and so given that you guys uh, are, are not uh, that sorry in uh, uh, business um, uh, schools, you might not know, obviously everyone knows the guy on the left, I'm assuming. Um, but uh, for, a, for a prize, does anybody know the gentleman on the right that has the blue tie on and the glasses? Um, does anybody know who that gentleman is? BlackRock CEO, well done, Ian. Larry Fink, bravo, A plus for you, my friend. So Larry Fink, for you guys not in business or, or are familiar with BlackRock, they are basically the largest asset manager in the world. Uh, $7.4 trillion of US dollars under management. And so when he writes his CEO letter every year, people listen. Um, and it, it's been a trend uh, in a while where, you know, at first they were talking about, uh, you know, liquidity and financial access and, and, and traditional business things. But if you go and search Larry Fink's letters, I, I pulled the CEO one, he also wrote one to clients, uh, to his clients, and this came out um, in September-ish, um, after he actually went to the UN uh, on the, uh, and, and kind of really was uh, impressed by this idea of climate change. Um, and they, they hold a lot of energy uh, um, assets. And so I, I can't remember the exact amount, but somewhere around 22% of their, their asset, uh, somewhere around that number is, is in, in some sort of energy. And, and I just pulled a couple snippets out of this letter. Um, and, and what I want to kind of do is, is just introduce that, and Matt's going to be talking about this idea of systems and systems change. But what I'm really excited about is that, you know, there, there is not just one way that the transition or transition is going to take place. This is going to be up to us individuals. It's going to be up to, you know, the businesses. It's going to be up to governments, uh, local, provincial, national. But it's really getting pushed. The, kind of the stick, the sharp end, in my opinion, has been um, finance and investing. Where is the money? What is the money saying? 
And so if you can't get investment because your business model is antiquated or your risk is too high, it's going to be a very difficult future for you. And so what he's saying, if you see on the, on the bold there, um, you know, things are rapidly changing and that we're on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. And this is the guy that, you know, holds a lot of the cards. Um, and so the letter goes on to this idea that in the near future, uh, that we must anticipate a significant reallocation of capital. And, and so that's kind of a, a, a note to big companies to say, oh, wow, OK, you know, um, what, where's that capital going? And then in bold underneath, it's this idea that climate risk is investment risk. And so companies have to be aware of this and they need to uh, uh, deal with it and not just maybe have a, a greenwashed article somewhere in their annual report, but they need to take this on a lot more um, aggressively and be a lot more transparent. Um, and so I'm not gonna read this all out, uh, but I, and we'll provide this, uh, these slides for you guys. Uh, at least I will, I'm, I'm assuming Matt will as well. Uh, but it, it's this idea that, you know, if your existing investments uh, present a high sustainability related risk, such as uh, thermal coal producers, um, there's going to be a challenge. Uh, you're going to have a hard time accessing capital. And there's some really exciting innovations in capital happening where your rate of uh, debt repayment is actually pinned to your uh, uh, GHG uh, emission reduction or whatever the metric is that you, you negotiate with your, your lender. Um, and, and so the language that he's using in this and he even brings up the Paris Agreement, which is fantastic because one, he's in the US and we all know that the US is not, um, I, I believe currently signed on, um, but it's this idea that we have a, a business leader that owns a lot of, of the, or manages a lot of the assets is pushing towards a low carbon economy. And that's gonna give um, uh, kind of a pause to people. Um, and this, this quote, you know, given the groundwork we have already laid, engaging on disclosure, you know, investment risk around sustainability, um, you know, they are, because they own all these assets, they're going to vote against board decisions uh, that are not progressing on sustainability. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about activist investors um, and uh, it's becoming, you know, much more of a powerful tool than divestment um, is. And so... You know, this this idea that McKinsey has of the activist investor, these groups that get together and have enough shares that they can get the attention of the company happens to be quite, um, uh, you know, a powerful tool to make uh, change in, in the world of uh, specifically an energy transition. But there's examples in the in the banking industry or an ag industry, whatever the industry is. But, but people have to be aware now that there are other tools than just divestment. There is the divestment world and there's also activists. Um, and so with all these increasing pressures coming from whether it's the, uh, the, the voting uh, board member, or the voting shareholders, or the lack of, of financial resources available due to the investment or banks and institutions changing what their expectations are for investing in, in areas. Um, of, of, uh, that have high impact on climate change. And so I kind of just wanted to bring these ideas to the forefront because I feel that, uh, you know, in the media these days, we, we see a lot of, of uh, East versus West um, or liberal versus conservative, and it's very polarized. Um, and so what my approach is, is that we, while that is important um, to discuss and to have a, a proper conversation, we also have to be aware that there's a lot of influence coming from um, very, very uh, well-respected groups that have a lot of influence. Um, and when, when, when I see these letters like Larry Fink's coming out, um, you know, lobbying people to think about social change or uh, business model change, um, I, I'm optimistic um, because that will hopefully um, turn the conversation to be more productive. Um, but I think what Matt's hopefully going to, to, to get into is, is this idea that the system itself, I just highlighted one little sliver of a very complex uh, um, systems change, which is taking place around energy transition. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I always go back to this slide as my concluding slide. And I, I was in Norway when I took this at a conference, and this was just some graffiti in, in a park. Um, and it's this idea that I, I challenge you guys 
to question things like just it's like ask people where did you get that information from like in an academic way like cite your source in the sense that, that we need to be able to defend things we need in a in a academic way but also in a way that opens up dialogue because i don't think there is a right answer there are many answers that will lead us towards a future that hopefully will be sustainable and inclusive um, in the future uh, and energy, I think, in a Canada is is one of the is the one of the flagships of of uh, whether our society can transition into something that that uh, is is allows us to all self actualize and, and really grow. Um, and so that's my 14 minutes up. I am going to now pause and transition this over to Matt. Okie dokie. So can someone use can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Thumbs up. Awesome. So thanks. Thanks, Houston, for um, for setting the table perfectly for what, what I'm going to offer here. Um, I, I feel like there are lots of indicators, as, as you allude to, that suggest that the tides are changing with respect to where investment capital is flowing. Um, there's lots of different sociocultural narratives that are suggesting that there's shifts underway. There's lots of landscape challenges around a, pan, a global pandemic, um, things that are outside of our control, like the cost of like a, the, the cost of a barrel of oil, etc. What I think we can't negotiate is that we are experiencing uh, an evolution of the energy landscape. And so, what my what I'm going to offer here is a way to look at how there exists this moment where there's this evolution in the space. And at the same time, uh, this, this, this proposition, which I would agree with Houston in saying that there's a lot of polarization around the conversation of energy. Uh, and in my experience, it's largely because we don't know what a, the sustainable future is. And there is not one single silver bullet that will allow us to uh, identify exactly the pathway to get there. And so because there's so much at stake, it's so close to home for many people to transition a, a huge amount of, uh, of, of the Canadian and Albertan economy uh, to figure out how we actually move towards a sustainable future really makes it really difficult and challenging and close to home and a food on the table conversation in many ways. And so at the end of the day, if there's a lot, if, if there's a lot of polarization uh, around the conversation of energy and the energy landscape is shifting, how are we actually gonna carry forward? And so I'm gonna offer a presentation um, wearing my hat as a lead of special projects for the Energy Futures Lab, which is a, a project that uh, I've been working on with RT Initiative and a great team with the Natural Step Canada to try to really respond to this, this notion that I've been sharing so far. And so the question is how, if there's an evolution in the landscape and if there's a lot of polarization around the energy conversation, how the heck can we carry forward uh, to address the urgency of climate change and to address the barriers that are at play to actually start carrying the, those changes forward. How do we do it? And so the Energy Futures Lab is something that's been going on for the last five years or so. I've been very fortunate to be part of the, the early, uh, I guess that the, the beginning of it, the genesis of it. Uh, I've been part of the design and delivery team to figure out how we can create a meaningful way to respond to these polarized conditions knowing we need to take some action. So I'm gonna overview the Energy Futures Lab and at the very end, I'm gonna to respond to what Houston shared around systems change. Um, so the Energy Futures Lab is really looking at trying to address the question of how we can use Alberta's leadership in today's energy system to create the energy system that the future requires of us. That's the question. There is no single silver bullet solution to that. It is very complex. It is a what we call a wicked problem because it's messy, it's tangled, it's emotional, it's, it's difficult. How do we use Alberta's leadership in today's energy system to create the energy system that the future requires of us? It's messy, it's hard. Um, it also, I think really importantly, honors that we have a lot of strengths in Alberta to build from. There is a whole bunch of people, uh, people um, resource, there's technological resource, there's infrastructural resource, there's economic resource. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, intellectual resource. 
uh, that we can honor and build upon. And at the same time, the energy system that the future requires of us, that's a difficult thing to try to parse out. And so if we have an idea of what we can appreciate and work with and honor from today and have a general sense of what, what our response is, what our vision of the energy system that the future requires of us is, it starts to allow us to hopefully get to work together. So we're not just stuck in a thought exercise and or a highly partisan public discourse around the issue. How can we get an clear enough around our strengths and enough around our vision that we can start working together and respond to that question meaningfully? So that's what the lab's all about. How do we do that? Well, really, it's really our ability, it's a function of our ability to bring diverse perspectives into a room to work on it. If we just advocate for creating a, um, a, a, an analysis around the climate change impact of a fossil fuel today compared to tomorrow, it's, it's, just, it's, it's not gonna get people on board. <laughs> and and there, there's a lot of examples where we could just throw more data at each other uh, from a certain perspective to advance the rhetoric around uh, climate activism or drilling as, every last ounce of oil out of the ground, et cetera. These, these sorts of analyses uh, coming from a single player uh, can and has been fostering additional polarization in my humble opinion. So the lab is trying to say, hey, well, in order to really address this, well, let, let's bring these poles together. Let's bring a mic, we call it a microcosm of the energy system together to figure out what are you thinking about? What are you believing? What are you noticing from all these different vantage points and then to figure out how we can get, again, clear enough on where we are today, clear enough around what we think the energy system of the future requires of us is, and then get to work together. It has to be more than a thought exercise. It has to be more than conversations. And so really what the lab is, it's a function of 70 leaders that we call fellows that agree to, to take a 12 month commitment to addressing the question I shared before. And that's a, that's a, that's a difficult thing because a lot of a lot of um, a lot of the the rooms I find myself in tend to want to tend to create the conditions for folks to have to have the answer, but really what we're doing is bringing folks in to deliberately not have the answer and to deliberately be curious and in inquiry uh, and with prepared to take action, of course, with respect to how we address this issue. So we call it a lab as such. It's a, we, we're not, we don't have the answers, a lab, just like a chemistry lab, this is a metaphorical lab, just like a chemistry lab where you go in with hypotheses and you test things and you, in, and you falsify things and you validate other things. At the end of the day, you're tinkering around with different things and, and working with and building on the things that are working. And so that's what this lab is. It's just with people and, and getting people together to figure out how we can meaningfully respond to the problem. So really what I've alluded to here in the metaphorical lab, what we recognized five years ago is that we needed to create a forum, a true forum for collaboration and innovation. And that, those two words, collaboration, innovation are abused in my opinion. We don't really practice collaboration and it's difficult for us to really practice innovation across organizations. And, and, and again, to meaningfully respond to a polarized issue, we ought, to get, uh, we ought to get different perspectives in a room in a way that we can be in inquiry and action. We need to truly practice collaboration and innovation. And so that was our move. That's what the lab is, it's our move. And, and I'll share more about some of where we're at with that in a moment. But you can see on this slide, this is just a capture of some of the, some of the partners and some of the convening partners from, from the lab. There's more actually at play here, but you can see there's a mix of industry, there's a mix of sector, a mix of industry, uh, there's, a, there's a mix of, um, of, of, of organizational size, ge there's geography, um, diversity, et cetera. And so this is just to show that we need to get lots of different perspectives in a room to start to address these things well. And so what do we believe? We believe that we must position ourselves competitively, competitively in, a, in a changing global energy system. Again, it's not negotiable that the energy system's evolving. So how is Alberta gonna compete? I'm, I, was, I spent almost all my life in Alberta. I've got three young kids and I want them to be able to thrive in a future economy, just like I've been able to thrive. And in order to do so, we need to figure out how we're gonna create conditions that Alberta can be competitive 
in all spaces, but especially the energy space, which we're already known for. So we believe that we need to position ourselves competitively for an evolving future. Uh, secondly, innovation is central to the Alberta story. Uh, and there's so many examples of that. And, you know, SEGD is a, uh, one of the examples in the oil and gas sector. What an incredible uh, innovation that's allowed us to advance the industry in, in so many ways and advance other industries too. And then lastly, our continued prosperity relies on us leveraging our strengths and our past to transition to the future. Uh, and so again, this, this stance we take is that we can, we can really leverage our know-how here. And there's lots to leverage to do that. So the social innovation lab approach suggests that if there's different people working on this issue in different ways, and we invite them to all come together to, in the spirit of action and inquiry to figure this out, oftentimes we are metaphorically entering a room together like the graphic on the left, where people are thinking differently, they're acting differently, they're in some instances are moving in completely different directions. There's no coherence at play really. And so what we do then is we invite folks into the room to, again, with a strong convening question like what I've shared, how do we use Alberta's leadership to create the energy system that the future requires of us? And then we, 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 we metaphorically and sometimes literally sit in a circle and say, what does this mean? What are the tough conversations that we need to have? And, and, uh, and in fact, we, we facilitate those tough conversations. But really what we're trying to do here is really empathize and understand different perspectives. And there's, there's no just single pole. It's not, you know, you're liberal or conservative. It's not that you believe in, uh, in, in drilling every last ounce of oil out of the ground and or turning, you know, turn, <laughs> turning the, you know, keeping every last ounce in the ground. It's, there's, there's all these different poles and there's a lot of understanding, again, deeply rooted into our perspectives on energy, on energy transition and how we identify with energy as people. Uh, and what we want to create for future generations. This is an exercise of getting shared. What is it that we can leverage with our strengths today? And what is the future that we really, what is the future uh, energy system um, that we want to create? What's the energy system that the future requires of us? Getting shared, it got, it's so difficult. Uh, and it's so difficult when there's, when there's polarization. And it's, it's, it's so difficult, and uh, especially with, um, with a diverse uh, with a group with such diverse perspectives in a state of polarization. So um, what we've done and one of the key outputs of the Energy Futures Lab so far in the last five years is we've come up with a workable vision of our response to that energy system that the future requires of us. And we've had lots of people from organizations like the previous slide say that this is a workable vision. It is what we call roughly right. It is safe enough to try. It's not perfect, but it's clear enough, it's ambitious enough, uh, and you know, notwithstanding some kinks to some language, et cetera, it's something that we can use to, and, and, and agree that we ought to start working towards. And so again, we're getting shared in this middle graphic and then to the right, what we wanna do is let perfection, uh, not let perfection get in the way of progress. If we're roughly right, that's right enough to get moving. And so if we start getting moving, we can move roughly in the same direction, knowing that we're starting to get the wheels in motion and move towards that future that we want to create. And so what we do is try to create the conditions for smaller groups to self-organize around the initiatives that they see and or that they have expertise in that are allowing us to move towards that roughly right future. And then we, we let it go. We facilitate the self-organizing of people working on initiatives that are hopefully accelerating our transition to that future. And at the same time, we're getting more shared. Is that vision right up to date? Are our initiatives accurate? Are the arrows actually going at the right angle or are they way off in moving towards the vision we're trying to create? You can see it's a, it's a lab we're learning very actively. I think it's a really good example of the adaptability word that Houston alluded to uh, at the get-go in his presentation. So Matt, you've been talking a lot, like you're in the clouds, man, like get, what, what does this really mean? Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is talk through, actually I'm gonna jump back to the slide and I'm gonna talk through a couple examples of these self-organizing bubbles. Okay, I'm gonna talk just through just a few of them. Um, again, so for the sake of time, I can circle back to more of them. But what are those self-organizing bubbles? What are some of those initiatives that are moving towards the energy system that the future requires of us? 
Well, here's one of them. And I think this is one of the most intriguing things to consider is one of the themes of the lab, one of the key themes is what is the future of a hydrocarbon? I think that's a tough nut to crack. What is the future of a hydrocarbon? Uh, is there a way that we can develop a hydrocarbon that is fit for the future, that participates in a circular economy, that remains in our economy over and over again, et cetera? How is it, are there, and that's one way, are there other ways that we can, that we can create hydrocarbons that are fit for, the, for a sustainable low carbon economy? And so one of our moves here is looking at alternative ways to combusting bitumen. It's, you know, once we burn bitumen, it's in the, it's in the atmosphere. We can't do anything right now with CO2. Uh, we can bury it at best, but we're not even doing that well. And so to harness it, um, there's still, it's still very, a very difficult thing to work with. So how can we use an Alberta hydrocarbon uh, in order to contribute to things that uh, can remain in the economy over and over again, like, um, like different materials like carbon fiber or graphene? Which are, which are incredibly important materials in our society, which can be used over and over again. And then the hydrocarbon stays in the economy for multiple uses. You can get my drift, right? So this is one example. How can we look at bitumen beyond combustion? And there's lots of people working on how we can create this. It's being led by a, an Energy Futures Lab fellow from Alberta Innovates, uh, who's, who's carrying this forward quite a bit in, in many different ways. And I could talk about it more if, if there are more questions. Um, another example is this one on growing a lithium industry uh, in Alberta. So lithium, uh, lithium is basically uh, where Alberta is sitting on the third largest lithium resource in the world, which was a surprise to me until I entered the Energy Futures Lab and started working on this. I didn't know that. And so how do we access the lithium resource is actually through oil and gas expertise. We can get it from oil and gas wastewater. It's sitting in tailing ponds. Uh, we can access it through, uh, through water on inactive wells. There's lots of different ways that we can access this resource. And lithium, as you're probably aware, is a primary resource in, in the battery industry and especially, especially um, in demand for electric vehicles, which we all know is on the rise, but it's used in other battery products as well. So if we grow our ability to access a lithium resource, we're using skills and expertise uh, and infrastructure that we're already using in oil and gas. In fact, we can even choose some uh, and use some inactive wells that are currently a liability as, a, as an asset to be able to, to gather lithium. Can we build? Can we build some uh, a value chain uh, on battery? Could we? Could we have a gigafactory in Alberta? We have the third largest resource. Why not? So you can see, like, we need the skills and expertise and infrastructure. And if we build more batteries, we're accelerating electric vehicle uh, production and responding to the evolution of that market. So what a compelling opportunity, right? And so it, the, story, the story really is, same with Benjamin on, beyond, on combustion, uh, beyond combustion is a story of and, not is it, is it fossil fuel or not? It's, well, we could use fossil fuel, lots of fossil fuel resources uh, um, tangibly and intangibly and allow us to accelerate to a future energy system. And there are more examples, but again, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna share those two. Um, two initiatives that are really close uh, to me that I operate in day to day, but just, just in wrap up, is something called the Energy Futures Roadshow, because what, what this is, it's more than technological innovation. It's also how people interact with each other, right? It's, it's also getting these conversations in various communities across Alberta. And so we're putting the, the, the same question that, I, that the Energy Futures Lab has put forward. How do we create the energy system that the future requires of us? Uh, not just to the Energy Futures Lab fellows, but into smaller communities across Alberta because they have very unique challenges and opportunities in responding to that. And so we've been we've gone to eight communities. I'm working right now with the town of Athabasca and the town of Whitecourt to address this in again a very similar way, get people working together and ideating together and learning from each other and empathizing with each other. Uh, but we've also gone to communities like Grand Prairie and Red Deer, um, to the town of Devon to Crowsness Pass and to Drayton Valley, right? The origin of the yellow vest. And then lastly, again, one, um, 
there are so many ways to accelerate our transition to the energy system that the future requires of us. I'm currently building, uh, um, building out a program to look at how artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning can allow us to accelerate our transition as well. And there's lots of different applications there. So I, that's an example of something that I'm working on day to day in addition to the roadshow. So I'm at 15 minutes now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. We're gonna stop my screen share and be really excited to hear some of the questions or comments. Um, I do have this slide around the broader systems change. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take two minutes and just do that because I think it's an important thing that to kind of bring Houston's presentation to my home is that really what's going on is if, the, if an energy system, like what we're talking about today is evolving, we could think of that as, a, as the system changing, right? And so the lab itself is looking at addressing systems change by working at three interconnected levels and with, with specific motivations at each level. First, uh, how can we support niche innovations like the lithium industry to grow? and different innovators in that industry, among others. How can we support them to amplify what they're up to so they can demonstrate different narratives that showcase the energy system that the future requires of us? Secondly, how can we use, how can we nudge systems? So there are very, there are incumbent players, be it large companies, uh, economic markets and policies, et cetera, which create barriers for those innovators to actually have adoption or receptivity to the innovations they're creating. How can we nudge those big players to realize that there's gigantic opportunities here? I'll never forget uh, a director of, of CNRL was in the room where we were talking about growing a lithium industry and just realized, holy smokes, what an opportunity. You know, so there's, idea, there's opportunities here to really shift and nudge systems. And then lastly, and ultimately, in order to address polarization, especially in an evolving, an evolving systems change context, how do we change the dominant cultural narratives? If each and every one of us and our next door neighbors can identify with how we can show up and live and thrive in an evolved energy system, and we can, we can speak to examples that demonstrate a, a story of both fossil fuel and alternative and renewable energies, this becomes a lot more compelling for driving uh, investment, for uh, allocating those dollars in the, the investment community to the right things, to be able to start to um, hold our political leaders accountable, to inspire new innovators and leaders of businesses like yourselves, et cetera. So really what at, what's at play, we're very conscious of this, this, this model we call it the Giels model. It's, it's a socio-technical, uh, multi-level multi, multi -level socio socio-technical um, uh, systems change model. That's the academic word because it has been studied a lot in academia. So you can look up Frank, uh, Frank Eels if you want to learn more. So thanks for bearing with me for those extra few minutes. Looking forward to hearing some questions. Yeah, so thank you again, Matt and Houston, for such an in-depth look and holistic look into the transitions in the energy sector today. Um, yeah, as mentioned, we will be opening up the floor for questions. Uh, you can put them in the chat. Or if you want, you can unmute your um, microphone and just ask directly as well. Uh, I'll jump in here with a question. Um, if I'm a student now and I have an idea um, that I want to push forward, um, would you be able to give some high level roadmap of how to go about with that? Do I approach uh, organizations or governments or um, is it good to try starting an own company? Like what would be a, a good path forward if I'm trying to promote an idea? Uh, Houston, I think you're still muted. Yeah, sorry. I was just talking to my wife, uh, her two-year-old son's just coming <laughs> up the stairs. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, Gideon, I pre appreciate your, your uh, uh, question and, and uh, I know Matt will have, have uh, a lot to say as well. Um, can I just ask you to maybe just expand a little bit on what the idea is because uh, there, and, and also where are you uh, right now um, in this beautiful world of ours? Sure. Uh, so currently I'm a master's student. Um, I'm in the Sustainable Energy Development Program, the SEDV program with the uh, University of Calgary. Um, and I know there's other students also that have um, big ideas and they'll be 
related to our, our capstone project. Um, and uh, I myself am formulating ideas, um, and this would be related to uh, production of bioplastics or um, looking into this idea of taking uh, waste biomass and converting it to, um, to these bioplastics. Um, somehow making combustible products, that type of thing. So that would be my idea, but I know there's others in our program that would have other ideas. And I'm curious, what is, what is a good, is it government, is it private, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, so I will quickly address that um, to say that uh, USC has put its kind of flag in the ground for entrepreneurial thinking and supporting innovation. Um, we're a little behind the game um, when you look at other schools, uh, but I, I, I'm really optimistic. And with Innovates Calgary, um, their new mandate to really help students and, and research faculty to pull their innovations out of the uh, out of out of the USC and into uh, into something viable outside. Um, I, I've never seen a better time to for a student to actually take a run at these things. The, the risk uh, is a lot lower because you have, whether it's the Hunter uh, Hub that has $40 million to support students, whether it's the Hunter Center at the University of Calgary at, through Haskane um, that has a ton of programs, there's new, a new certificate in entrepreneurship um, and so I think it's it's actually an ideal time. And so I would encourage you, um, whether it is to reach out, uh, what, I, what I really like to do is to, you know, take people maybe with more technical expertise like yourself by the sounds of it and partner them with somebody in the MBA world who maybe is just a machine at building the, the, the financial models and the business models and, and really figuring out the feasibility of it. And I think we need to collaborate more between technical experts and then, you know, our, uh, our faculty in Haskane um, because they might not have the same ability to think about complex solutions because they're really focused in the, in the, in the kind of actual business model. Um, and by partnering people from both uh, um, technical areas as well as the business school, I, I see a lot of oppor opportunity. And the last shout out I'll give is to Creative Destruction Lab. If it's something that is kind of game changing and, and I mean, if it's, I, don't, I call it a side hustle, meaning something that is, you know, an awesome uh, business, but it, it might not be something that is, is revolutionary. But if you are working on something that you think is kind of game changing, like some of the stuff that Matt was talking about, I mean, CDL is, is globally one of the leaders for sure. And, and the USC um, has the CDL for energy, for prime, meaning anything um, general, like a general area, and then one for ag uh, that I'm, I'm the moderator for. So uh, I'd be, you should just Google me or reach out to me through my email address. And I'd be happy to have a, a private conversation with you because because once I understand your business more, I could do a lot of support. I could I could give you a lot of help. There's courses in Haskane that actually take people like yourself and partner them with an MBA, um, and they work together to move your idea forward. Um, so I'm just going to pause there and let Matt jump in if there's anything else. That's great, and also feel free to reach out too. I've done a lot of work with circular economy stuff, and you know, waste to energy is is one of the one of the pathways towards that, especially the creation of combustible combustible uh, biofuels. Um, anyways. So there's that, but also I, I might I might throw out there there's there's no shortage of accelerators. So Houston's got a great idea. I'm sitting in the Inc, which is part of Platform Calgary, and they're connected with um, Foresight, the Foresight Clean Tech Accelerator, I believe. Uh, they also I would also encourage you to socialize it, like just just socialize it. Call some folks who might be interested in it, and just hear what they say. Um, Platform Calgary has a, a program. I, it's really cheap or, or free. It's called it's called discovery. It starts on next Tuesday, I think, um, but they do it every season, and so it just helps you get the, some early legs to see if the idea is actually viable, and they provide some support and accountability windows and tools in order to do that. So, yeah, feel free to reach out if if you need a repeat of any of those things. I'd be glad to to support you on next steps too. That's great. Great to hear, and also this idea of partnerships. And I think a lot of us are kind of stuck in our own thinking and um, don't see necessarily the business side of, of things, uh, but it's good to know that, um, that, that we can have some support here. So uh, from the chat, uh, Tayeba is asking, um, she said, I was hoping if you can speak to a little bit about the trust slash willingness investors have been investing in the renewable sectors. So the Alberta oil and gas sector has played such an important role in shaping the economy of our province. 
So she is curious to know how this transition will take place and what that really means for individuals looking to start their career in that area. Houston, I'll start and feel free to build on it. I, I wish I had the answer to this. I, I feel like um, uh, if it's not obvious, everyone's scrambling and trying to figure out what, 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 the, what the heck the play is in an, in an evolving energy system. So if they don't know how they're gonna respond to, uh, to play in, a, in an energy sector that does have a lot more renewables in it, um, they're trying to figure it out. And so for, um, how it will take place, I don't know, but you know, the, the more that folks care about it, the more that students are enrolling in it. Um, again, that's one indicator that uh, that the incumbents need to prepare for it. Um, there's lots of other indicators, and in, uh, to dive into some of what Houston shared around uh, around um, the world kind of moving in that direction. But who knows, right? Um, for those looking for a career in that area, I feel like the world is your oyster. There's so much so much room to grow uh, and to be in, in, at, at an innovator stage, kind of like what Gideon's alluding to, uh, but also to join like, um, so, uh, you know, Skyfire Energy is a solar installer and they've, they've, they've gone from four employees to 50 in four years and they're slated to go from 50 to 120 in one. So you can just see the double, like is solar's time here? Like there's gonna be so many career opportunities. So I would, again, get out there and start talking to people and socialize, uh, socialize as much as possible, volunteer with an organization or two to start learning the landscape because there's a, there's, there's a whole slew of opportunities available, available for those that are interested. Awesome, Matt. So um, I'll take a slightly different slant and I, I get asked a similar question by my students is how do they be, get a job in sustainability? And, and I would argue that, you know, any job you get, uh, you can champion um, sustainability. And that goes the same with alternative energy. Um, like I worked at a, a company called Dirt Environmental Solutions and I championed putting on wind turbines and solar panels. And, and I, I, I ran against the wall a couple of times and, and, you know, it, sometimes there's curmudgeons and derailers in your organization and and i look at it as a challenge um is is how can i make the business case how can i win this over how can i evolve and work with the partners to make this more viable for a company and so you know while working for skyfire is excellent you know i would also say that you could work for any company um you know ikea they they stick you know, solar panels on their on their uh their roofs and stuff so i think with your your with this uh, i'm assuming your attention and your background um being involved in this organization um wherever you end up just champion alternative energy um i also th uh, think that um, we are alternative energy has a lot to learn from the legacy of traditional oil and gas in alberta I just uh, did a, a class this week on social license to operate. And I think that some of the things that we've seen around pipelines are going to come to the windmills, are going to come to the solar farms. And, and regardless, there is going to be community conversations. And, and, you know, the social license to operate aspect of what uh, um, has occurred around, um, especially pipelines, you know, I think that there are some best practices that, that all industries can learn from. Um, I think it's not just our, our oil and gas industry or our pipeline industries uh, that have risk and exposure to social license pressures or community pressures. Um, wind turbines, you know, whether these other alternative energies, they can have pushback. I uh, was part of a company that used composting, collected compost, uh, put it in a piece of, of uh, tech and produced like really high quality compost. And um, there was lots of pushback in the industrial zone for the smell, for this, for that. So I think that what I, I'll finish with just those two points. One, you can be in any company and champion these 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 thoughts or these technologies, as well as um, you know we can learn from the past, and I think that's something we have to do. And your generation has to look at the follies of the past. We need to be aware of our history, whether it's the the complexity of our First Nation history, or whether it's the complexity of the Black Lives Matter movement, or around the energy sector. Um, we need to understand why we're here, and and that will allow us to hopefully um, avoid some of the mistakes or as Matt and I refer to the funnel is tightening in the natural step kind of language. And another question from the chat um, from Sojong. 
I sorry if I mispronounce it. Um, so with COVID-19 situations, especially in the US, um, she feels like many people don't listen to reason, even with enough evidence, especially when the economy is down. Um, I think we become less innovative and become more polarized. Um, if we were to move away from fossil fuel, then aren't we going to expect even more economy downturn, um, example in Alberta? And if reasoning with science does not work with many people, how can we accelerate discussion about transition? This is a really good question. And um, I partly, uh, I, and I don't mean this pejoratively, but I partly reject the premise that you can't be economically viable or feasible um, without fossil fuels. <laughs> I, I feel like, uh, again, there's solar, the solar installers are just, their business is through the roof. Like, I feel like there's stories of the lithium industries um, raising a whole bunch of money right now and having tremendous amounts of success. I feel like it, um, I, I kind of, I, so I, I don't want to fully kind of deflect my response, but just to share, like, there are lots of opportunities to demonstrate that there is a, a tremendously viable economic future uh, by not focusing solely on fossil fuels. And uh, again, that's a, the express purpose of the Energy Futures Lab. There's ways to look at it in a both and way. Um, the other thing I, I might offer is that, um, uh, is that there's, there's, a, there's a good model called the iceberg model where you can kind of look at events that are occurring and realize that events that are occurring kind of trickle all the way down to different underlying structures and then even further down into the beliefs that we hold as, as humans. And again, to, to try to, um, for someone who has, has been in the oil and gas sector, for example, for, uh, for multiple generations of, uh, in their family, it's gonna, there, there could be an identity piece or even community, like uh, communities that I've worked with in the Energy Futures Roadshow identify as being oil and gas communities. It's like deeply held rooted beliefs. And you can't just throw data at people and say that um, you know, the world's changing, forget about it. It's part of their identity, it's in their heart, right? It's in their, it's in their identity. So there needs to be ways to access other parts of our, ourselves that, that look more deeply than just the mind. Um, and I think just throwing, I think that using data only, I feel like this is kind of for climate change activists, the greatest downfall is that they just spout out facts to people, but they're not capturing the hearts and minds of people. Cause that's actually more, that can generate more change than just the facts themselves in, in my experience. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not going to take up too much time because I know that it's five and we're supposed to uh, be wrapping up. So I'll just uh, leave it with this idea that I, you know, I try and just live the life that I feel is authentic. And, and if someone's willing to listen and have an open conversation, then I'm really excited to engage with them. And if somebody's, you know, rooted in their own beliefs for their own lived experience, um, and are operating on their own interpretation of the facts, then, you know, I, I don't think we all need to agree. I think that there'll always be the beautiful thing about society is there's different opinions. We're not just a bunch of minions all marching in the same direction. And so we need to embrace uh, a diversity and we need to embrace the fact that not everybody um, needs to agree. Uh, but, you know, if you live a life that is authentic and you feel like you're living a good life and contributing to a better world, um, that's, that's the best thing I can do. Um, and it's not uh, my responsibility to convince someone or persuade someone. Uh, my job is uh, hopefully to, to engage in, in meaningful dialogue and those people that are super excited and want to collaborate and, and I can help or they can help me. Great, let's build a community together like Matt's Diagram and start championing what we believe um, a better world looks like. And if other people want to go in a different direction, um, that's, that's their prerogative, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, that's kind of how I, I've tried to approach these things. Um, where in my past, when I was younger, I was quite um, outspoken and probably a little bit on the aggressive side and championing, you know, it's my right. Um, and, and I just found that those conversations uh, never resulted in as much uh, forward momentum as, as being um, a little bit more compassionate and empathetic to people's uh, situations. So I'm going to wrap it up there because I know why we're over by four minutes. Mm, thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Um, so as mentioned, um, would, we are just gonna have an announcement about um, a future kind of registration as well, but yeah. And then that and the um, a quick poll and then we'll just be wrapping up after that. So if uh, Jiho could perhaps. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Ro. Um, so the hackathon is the newest addition to the ASA conference. For this year's hackathon, we will be collaborating with industry professionals to provide real life questions. And the hackathon includes training sessions for highly sought out skills, such as Swat Fire, R, and Python. And this will ensure that everyone has the working knowledge to compete in the hackathon, regardless of what faculty, what major, or what year you're in. This is also a great opportunity to develop not only your technical skills, but your soft skills as well. This includes leadership, communication, and teamwork. And there will also be many opportunities for students to network with professionals from the energy industry. And of course, like any other competition, there will be prizes at the end, depending on how well you place in the hackathon. So uh, make sure to join the series uh, hackathon on Eventbrite. The registration closes on November 12th. So make sure to register before then. I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and again, thank you, Matt and Houston, so much for this webinar. It's really interesting and such a good holistic view on kind of the transitions happening in the energy sector currently. Um, yeah, if anyone, if everyone, um, I'll be launching a poll. So if you would like to participate and just vote on the different questions here, um, it'll help us a lot in, yeah, it'll help us a lot in kind of, um, seeing what topics people want for the uh, conferences afterwards. And yeah, um, follow us on social media and everything if you want to learn more about ASEC events. And thank you all for coming and joining us. So yeah, I'll be having the poll up for another few minutes and then, yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone. I, I've got to run, Matt. Thank you for, uh, for helping, helping with this. It was great working with you and uh, uh, great job guys. Um, we'll uh, look forward to talking to you in the future. Bye-bye. Ditto to Houston. Take care. Take care, Houston. And thank you very much for, for the invitation, Ruhr and ASEC group. And again, please reach out if there's any additional questions from anyone. I'd love to continue the conversation. This is the, these types of conversations get me up in the morning. So re, reach out. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt.